feel like I've been in church already this morning with God's people, with God's presence, and um, enjoying what is happening today. If you have your Bibles or your sermon sections, I'm wrapping up this part of this series. We've been talking about how we can have a blessed home, a blessed family. And we've been taking the scriptures from the Beatitudes, which are in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. There is eight qualities that Christ presents to his people, to his church. And we have looked at four of those. This is the fourth one that we've looked at. And the key thought that we've had throughout this series has been what is at the very, very top of um, your sermon section there this morning. Um, I have another sermon section someplace, but I've got it right here. Okay, let's, look, let's read it together, okay? We are not just a Christian home. We are a Christ-centered family. And if you're here maybe for your first time, you might be saying, well, what, what is that really saying? It looks to me like that's a little redundant. Well, the reason that we are defining and qualifying each of these simply because we live in a culture today where 80% or more of the people in our nation would say, I'm Christian. And it becomes a cultural phrase they say, well, I, I'm not anything else, so I must, I must be Christian because we live in a Christian nation, so evidently I'm, I'm Christian. And years ago, we didn't have to really consider that being part of the thought pattern of those that we would maybe be talking to, but that's the case today. It just is. So as we look at that element of it, we have to understand that there's more than that. And so we are a Christ-centered family. In order to have a blessed home, we have to be a Christ-centered family. And there is a world of difference. The Christ-centered family, their value systems are different than that of the world's. The way they raise their children is different than that of the world. And right through another long list of different things that we can consider today. So as we look at this eighth beatitude that we would have in our lesson, but it's the fourth that we have here in this series, this is one that probably could be a, it could be a little difficult and it could possibly be, um, I'm going to qualify some things this morning in my in my presentation simply because um, I feel like I need to, because this is very, very convicting. So the key thought for today's lesson is this. If you are a Christian or a Christ-centered family, you will be persecuted. If you are a Christ-centered family, you will be persecuted. And the word for persecution um, I think that's the convicting part because we understand as we read church history and we read Bible uh, and and, and the illustrations that we have throughout God's word, and we understand what persecution really is. And I can honestly say to you this morning, um, whether it's um, um, right or wrong from that perspective, I really don't know of anybody in my sphere of people that are persecuted the way that we look at persecution from those from the early church history or even in other countries today. I don't know of anybody personally in my surroundings that because they are a Christ-centered person that they are really, really being persecuted So therefore, I look at the word persecuted as a pretty drastic word, 
And there might be some other words that maybe would describe what we could be going through. So anyway, uh, I might allude to that a little bit later on. But as we look at today's lesson, before we go there, we looked at in lesson number one, those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled. We looked at those that are pure in heart, they shall see God. And last week we talked about the peacemakers, not the peacekeepers, but the peacemakers. And today we're looking at blessed are those who are persecuted. And our reading continues in Mark, excuse me, Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to pick up with verse number 10. In verse number 10, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of right doing, of righteousness. And as Christ was talking to the people on the Sermon on the Mount that day, as he was giving these beatitudes, we understood they understood what he was talking about because of the persecution that was going on. And even what they didn't witness yet, Christ knew what would be ahead for them. And then he goes on and says in verse 11, and this might be a little more confusing, but we're going to get through it this morning. Blessed are you when people insult you. <clears throat> okay, I, I, I know you're holding it back persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, Christ was saying. And then in verse 12, he clears it up by saying, just rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. So we're going to look at this today and we're going to look at those that are persecuted because of right living. That's what he was talking about here. You're living right. You're living according to the word of God. You're following the spirit of God. You're trying to raise your family in the admonition of God. And you're involved with church life. You're involved with those things that are, that are, are uplifting and upbuilding for, for your kids and their character and their godliness. And in the midst of all of that, in the midst of all of that, Jesus says, there can be persecution coming to us, and it can come to us just simply because we're trying to do the right thing. Now, I know there's different kinds of persecution. You know, maybe one of the first things you think about, oh, yeah, I know some that were burned at the stake, and they were turned upside down, and they were lit on fire, and, and uh, they were tied to a tree, and and, 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 you know, then we have the underground church over in communist countries and, and you know, they, they secretly pass one page of the Bible that somebody so graciously gave them. They pass that one page of Bible throughout their underground church because that's all they have. So we understand that being part of the persecution, but there's all kinds of persecution. And I know today, I know today that we have situations um, where maybe where you work, maybe where you live, and uh, maybe nobody else would call it persecution, but you're going to call it persecution this morning because to you it's pretty severe, and I, I'm going to understand that, and obviously so does God. He understands that. But we're going to be persecuted not because we're being a weirdo, not because we're doing stupid things to get attention and we're being like the Pharisees, but we'll maybe be persecuted because of right doing. The very first illustration that we have of persecution in the Bible is back with Cain and Abel. Abel wasn't out just preaching to Cain. And Cain was not angry at Abel, um, or he was angry at Abel simply because of the way that he was living, the way that he was living, right living. And sometimes you don't have to say anything. Sometimes you don't have to do anything. You're just living right. And those in our world and the system of our world are not living that way. They can maybe ridicule you 
That would be another word that maybe I would use in our society more than the word persecution. We will get ridiculed and we will even maybe get made fun of. Big deal, right? We didn't get burned to the stake. That's what I'm saying. We've got to qualify this word persecution. And you know what? And maybe you have kids and you're teaching them to save themselves until they're married. And that word gets around the school and maybe they're made fun of because they're not going to violate that principle in their life because they want to save themselves for their spouse. There could be ridicule and persecution for that. It could be that you're asked to go to a movie and because of the language and because of the things that are in that movie, you're just going to say no. And that could even happen for adults. And are you kidding me? Why, why won't you do it? You know, we could call that persecution. And, um, you know, it could be that your kids are not going to play on, a, on, on a, a, a ball team because it's going to violate some of your principles regarding, regarding God and regarding what you're trying to teach them as being Christ followers. So there's all kinds of things that we can look at. Um, but the question this morning would be this. How can we prepare our family? Because this is the case. Let's say we're not really enduring or going through a lot of persecution. We have no idea what's going to take place over the next two, three, four, five, 10, 15 years if the Lord tarries his coming. We don't have no idea. But we can say this. We can believe it's going to get worse and not get better. We can believe it's going to get worse and not get better. There are things right now that the church has been ridiculed of just simply because it stood up, it's drawn its line in the sand, and the church has said, we're not going to violate that principle or those principles. We're going to stand true to what God's word says. And there is, there is pushback and there's ridicule and there's um, a, a sense of, of um, uh, jabber that's going on and the putting down of the body of Christ. So the question would be, how do we prepare ourselves? How do we prepare our family? How do you prepare your kids? Maybe this morning you're a young parent, and maybe you're a parent that you don't even have kids yet. And, um, you know, this message will be for you over the next few years as God blesses your life. So what do we do? How do we prepare our family for some of the things that we could be facing in the upcoming days, years, and months? It's very simple. I'm going to go through these points kind of quickly. Then I'm going to wrap it up at the end here with, um, with some comments. Uh, this is very, very simple. Three words, the first one, and they all start with the letter E. Just expect it, okay? As preparing our family for persecution, just tell them, hey, just expect it. And I remember, I remember very, very plainly that even though it's been a lot of years ago, that mom and dad were raising seven kids, and, and we were the PKs, we were the preacher's kid. Not only were we um, church-going people, that's a term that is being used a lot, just kind of church-going people. Don't we have a lot of church-going people today? You know, some people are going to church right now by sitting in their living room uh, with their PJs on, and they got somebody on TV, and bless God, they're really excited about being church-going people. And they're able to go to church without going to church, going to church. And they just don't know why we can't figure that out yet. Anyway, uh, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. But my point is this. There, there are things that are happening. There are things that are going on. But I believe, as my dad would say, you know, well, son, just, you know, why? Sure, they're going to. Why? He said, sure, they're going to make fun of you. Because he said, they're not living the way that, 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 that we know that God wants us to live. And, 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 and he would almost... He would almost, well, he would. He would kind of grin about it and let us know that, oh, by the way, I, I know that's going to happen. It happened with me at work. It, happens, it happened with me when I became a Christian. There were those that, 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 that you know, they, they called me a holy roller and various things. And I remember when my, when my oldest brother Rodney went to school after he became a Christian, and, and I think he was maybe in the 10th or 11th grade. And, and um, so um, 
something was said about his faith. Maybe he was praying for his food uh, over the lunch, uh, at lunchtime. And somebody called him a holy roller. And I don't know where he got this at. He, he just came back and said, you know what? I'd rather roll in the heaven than bounce in the hell. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good, you know. I remember when, um, I think it was John Maxwell, when he became a Christian and, and he went to school and they said, okay now, okay now, okay now, you know, Mr., Mr., Mr. John Maxwell, you know, he, this, 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 this big Christian, he's going to pray for our food. He said, Lord, bless this bunch as we eat this lunch, amen. <laughs> you know, what am I saying? There's going to be things that's going to happen in our life, but I, I can just see Dad right now with a smirk on his face. Why, sure, why? Why, the reason they're doing that is because they don't have... It's because they don't have Jesus in their life. They, they don't have Christ in their life. And he let us know, kids, we're different because we're Christians. And where did he get that? I think it's kind of in the Bible, right? It's right in God's word. So in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life, Timothy says, a godly life in Christ Jesus and they will be persecuted. Now, I think that's just pretty, pretty straightforward, okay? Christ-centered families, we're different. We're different. I didn't say we have to be weirdos and, and wear the signs and, 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 and draw attention to ourselves and, and, and turn people off from God. God forbid we would ever do that. I think there's something called common sense. I think for something as far as uh, that we know that, we, that God's given us a, a personality and he's given us some wisdom and knowledge as to what to do. But Christ-centered families, we are different than those families that are not Christ-centered. And I don't know why we think we shouldn't be. I don't know why there's been that little bit of a, uh, this will kind of blend it all together and uh, it's going to kind of be okay. No, we're different. And, 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 and we shouldn't be ashamed because we are different. Um, there's a price to pay. There's the price to pay. I remember we thought it was right for us to homeschool our boys the first couple years um, of, of, of grade school. I think kindergarten and first, maybe Todd was first and second. And I think Michael couldn't, Loretta couldn't handle that for more than kindergarten. So, you know, <laughs> she sent him off. But anyway, I, 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 I remember there were, and we were, we were in a, a, a an atmosphere and, and, and a, a school system that was, you know, wow. And boy, they, oh, you know. But you know what? It, it, it was okay. You know, we weren't embarrassed about it. We had no apologies. Later on, Michael and Todd went to school and, and they saved half the church or half the school, you know, not really, but they thought they could. My point is this there's a difference that we have. And by the way, I'm not saying you have to homeschool your kids. Matter of fact, some of you, I, I would say, please don't because you probably couldn't handle it, all right? My point is that there are whatever, whatever is in our lives that is different according to what we want to know what we should do because of God, let's just embrace it. Just expect it. There's another powerful verse that we have in John 15. If the world hates you, this is Jesus speaking, just keep in mind, just keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it will love you as its own. That must be where dad got that at. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Number verse 20. Remember that I told you a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. The words of Jesus, and as I read those, I know they're, they're, they're blunt, they're to the point, but as I read those, I feel and sense his love and his guidance and his wisdom in sharing that. So just teach your kids and teach yourself and teach each other. Let's just expect it. Number two, endure it. 1 Corinthians 4, Paul says this, when we are cursed, we bless. <laughs> when we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. In other words, maybe he was saying, don't whine about it. 
Don't make a big deal. Don't whine about it. Don't go over here and feel sorry for yourself if there's a little bit of persecution going on. It persecuted Christ. It's going to persecute us. We understand he went before us. We're Christ followers. And we're different than the world. You know, we are not forming our life to the patterns of the world. So therefore, what can we do except expect it? And then we're going to endure it. We're going to endure it. Whatever it be. And you know what? As we endure it, it's going to cause our faith to grow. It was the early church. We read it throughout God's word. It was under the persecution of the church that it grew and their faith was deepened. And you know what? It's through the trials that we go through and the testings that we go through that we're going to be better. Absolutely. We don't like them. We don't invite them. We don't want them. We want them to go away. But on the other end of our testing and our, and our, 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 our trials and even the persecution, if that would, would want to go in that whole category, on the other side of that, we are going to have a deeper, deeper faith. Yes, that early church is a great example of what takes place through times of persecution. Endure it. Christ did. And he's got enough grace for us to do it. I came across this quote. I liked it very well. What unites the family? And uh, wow, this has been one of my things I've looked at throughout this entire week. When family identify, uh, when the family identity is strong, peer pressure is weak. Folks, if you get nothing else today, get this, okay? I got one more. First of all, when family identity is strong, peer pressure is weak. When family identity is weak, the peer pressure is strong. Isn't that good? I can't take credit for that. I don't even know who came up with it, but I found it, and I'm using it. I knew who said it, and, and I would give him credit. That's a powerful. That's amazing. And I look back into my home life, and hopefully the boys can look at their home life. When we were trying to raise our boys, you know, we tried our very, very best to do it the best way that we knew how to do it with God's help. And I believe with all of my heart, it is powerful. It is so powerful. When our identity as a family is strong, the peer pressure is not nearly as important. It doesn't have the effect on us. But boy, if there's no family identity and, and, and um, uh, togetherness and trust and love and acceptance, um, that peer pressure can be so inviting and can be so, so strong. So we're going to expect it. We're going to endure it. And number three, we're going to embrace it. We're going to embrace it. The context of the scripture that I'm getting ready to read, the context of this scripture that Peter gives us, um, he's talking to the Christians who are going through so much persecution, we cannot even put our brain around it. We cannot even, even imagine all that they were going through. They would actually put the Christians out into these big coliseums. And then they would turn the lions loose, turn the lions loose until they completely devoured those Christians in those coliseums. And in all the midst of that with, that was going on, this is what Peter said. He, first of all, he called them dear friends, dear friends, just, just saying that, you know, very well that he was connected with them. And he loved them and he cared for them and he, he wanted to do all, do all he could to encourage them and help them. He said, dear friends, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you. Don't be surprised as though something strange were happening to you. Boy, I don't know how we got away with it, but he said it. He said, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. Rejoice. Let's get down to verse 16. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. Do not be ashamed. But praise God that you bear his name. Now, there is a second part of this lesson that I want to give to us today. Hopefully, that will help us. You know, 
yeah, you know, I had a little suffering last week, Pastor Rich, and, and I did too, you know. They made fun of me, and I prayed for my food, and they were kind of making fun. I heard him snickering around over here, and, and, uh, or I was reading my Bible on my lunch break, and, and you know, whatever, whatever it could be. You know, I'm not going to participate in their jokes, or I'm not going to participate with the language that they use, and, and, you know, I know over here on the other side, they're just kind of, you know, they do their thing, and I'm over here probably a little bit more by myself than some of the other guys, but that's okay. That's okay. Um, but you know what? The thing I want us to really, really get beyond that is I want us to realize that it's a privilege to bear the name of Jesus Christ. It's a privilege to bear his name. It's a privilege to know that he is our savior, that he has saved us from our sins. And, and we are now a follower of Jesus Christ. And all that he has done for us, and he died on the cross for our sins. He bled and he died. He paid that ultimate price because he loved us. And sometimes, that's why I said at the very beginning of this lesson, it's a little convicting. It's a little convicting to me. I'll just use myself. It's a little convicting to me that I'm not suffering for Christ, maybe the way that I think I should be suffering for Christ. I'm not inviting it. I like it when things go well. I think we all do. Very few people want to pick a fight. Very few people want discord. Very few people want confrontation. But when it comes to this part of this lesson, I just, I just want to say, Lord Jesus, I want to praise you, first of all, that I'm, a, I'm, I'm your child. And I want you to know that Whatever ridicule I might go through, I'm going to praise you. I'm going to praise you because I bear your name. And I don't have any real true illustrations to give you this morning. The only little one I have, and it's, no, it's nothing, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to give it just, just to illustrate something. I remember when we moved to North Carolina and... Um, of course, I, I've told you before, they knew who lived in that house out there on the side of the road there, not too far from the church. Uh, and and, and so, so, okay, so they knew that, that the pastor of that Baldwin church moved in there, and, and, and he's got a couple kids, and, and so they're going to jump on that bus and go, you know, and of course, you know. But I remember going into the locker room during physical education, and um, they... Um, my first day at school, my first day at school, uh, I went to homeroom and, and my homeroom teacher saw me and saw my name and, and it, wasn't, it wasn't five minutes before he had another teacher in the homeroom and I happened to find out that he was, he was the basketball coach. And um, so, you know, I got real cocky and I said, yeah, I'm an all-star. Yeah, just moved in here from Ohio, and I was on the all, all Ohio team. What do you all want? <laughs> no, he said, hey, he says, uh, welcome, welcome to, 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 to uh, Beaver Creek School. I said, yeah. He says, um, you play basketball? And I said, I went to a Reds baseball game one time. No, that's an inside joke. You don't even understand that. But anyway, that had nothing to do with what he asked me, but I didn't say that. I said, no, I don't. I said, I do. Well, he said, oh, he said, man, he said, we'd like to have you on the team. He said, you know, I'm coach so-and-so. And, -so, and oh, he said, so anyway, so obviously I didn't go out for basketball um, because, uh, you know, I didn't, you know, I'm, I'm from Ohio and I didn't want to show up anybody in North Carolina. <laughs> no, I'm teasing you. My point of it is, I was not a ball player. I wasn't Mr. Athletic personified. So in gym class, in gym class, I don't know if I've ever said this before, but I remember they just started making fun of me. They just started calling me names and laughing at me. And I'm thinking, I didn't do anything to you guys. You know, I'm a sophomore. I, I just moved in the area and, you know, but I can honestly say, I can honestly say it didn't shake my faith. 
It didn't make me happy. But I didn't go home crying to dad about it. I said, you know, kids at school were kind of stupid, calling me names. And it was later on that year that there were two other guys that were Christians, and they got together with my brother Mark and I. Mark was almost four years younger than I. And we started a little singing group. Well, you would think that would maybe make things a little bit worse, and it could have, and maybe it did, but they just maybe kept their mouth shut at that point. And I remember that we uh, got this little singing group together, and, and two of these guys were on the football team. Maybe that was the difference, okay? So you got this little skinny kid from Ohio, and his little brother's got a, a girl's voice, um, and he sang the tenor part like Rex. But anyway, the point... <laughs> Oh, dear. Persecution! <laughs> and I remember we would go and we would sing at some of these nursing homes. And they had some connections and they were, they were Baptist boys and I didn't hold that against them. And, and, and you know, we got together and sung quite a, quite a few places. Well, it came, it came about that there was this, some kind of a talent show that was going to be at the school one evening. And these two football players that were part of this group that Mark and I uh, was a part of, they said, hey, we're gonna, we've been asked to sing over here at, this, at the talent show. I said, are you serious? And I can remember as if it were yesterday. It was yesterday. I tried to play a little piano, and we sung the song, Daddy Sang Bass. And, of course, my sissy brother said, Mom, Mama sang tenor, okay? <laughs> and it was, I mean, we had fun doing it. Of course, we love music, and we enjoy doing it. But, you know, my whole point is, when I look at persecution, that wasn't persecution. And that's why I maybe had a little bit of trouble with this lesson today, because I think persecution is if they break in the door here today and they hold a gun to our head and they say, okay, this is your last service. If you don't denounce Christ, if you don't denounce Christ today, we're going to kill you. I know that's pretty severe, but when I look at that as being persecution against some of the things that maybe we call persecution, that is maybe only just being a little bit made fun of or excluded from a conversation or whatever, let me just say this. It's okay. We bear the name of Jesus Christ. Let's not be ashamed of it. Let's bear his name. Let's praise him for who he is. And I know this. There are things that God has in store for us. Our faith is going to increase. We're going to go deeper with Christ. And, and you know what? I think maybe right now it would be a great time for us to prepare ourselves for what could be coming our way, okay? Maybe you can go through some scenarios. What are you going to say when they come to your house, if they would come to your house and say, we want your Bibles? Not just one, we want all of your Bibles. You might say, well, I'm going to give them to them because they need to read them. Well, that's a good point, right? <laughs> but the scripture says, blessed are those, blessed are those, is everyone who wants to live a godly life, who is persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And maybe that's the icing on the cake, right? That's the icing on the cake. I want to live here, and we want to live here in peace as much as possible. We don't want war. We don't want turmoil. We don't want inconvenience. We're so spoiled. Right now, this morning, with war going on throughout our world, and we're sitting here, and maybe as we complain about the gas prices or the food prices, and I don't like them either, but you know what? That's nothing, nothing compared to losing your home and losing your family and losing your life. Let's be Christ followers. Let's stand tall. Let's keep our heads up. Let's square our shoulders. And let's be thankful and proud to be a Christian. Amen? For the glory of God. God will help us. And we will be victorious. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, 
persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. That's what the Lord gave me to give to you this morning. And I do it with a humble, humble heart.